everybody, welcome to another video. Hope you're ready to flex those brain muscles. In this video, we're gonna continue talking about evaluating inverse trigonometric functions, but these composite functions, okay? So this is the second part of a two-part video series on this topic, so if you missed the first video, click right up there. But we're gonna get into some harder examples where our functions are different, right? Out here I have cosine inverse, and here I have sine, okay? So we haven't seen examples like this, so let's go ahead and get started. So cosine inverse is my outer function. Sine is my inner function. Sine of five pi over four is gonna give me some value, okay? And I'm gonna take the cosine inverse of that value and get some angle, okay? So this is gonna be an angle. This is an angle I'm looking for, theta. Basically what I can do is, well, wait a minute, I know this. This is on the unit circle, right? So I can actually just evaluate this, replace sine of five pi over four with whatever value it is, and then find the cosine inverse of that value. So let's go ahead and find sine of five pi over four. Maybe you're looking at your unit circle and you already know it, but I always think of it in terms of reference angles. So if I wrap around, it looks something like this in the third quadrant, and the reference angle is pi over four, right? I always draw from the x-axis. So I know pi over four for sine gives me root two over two. And since I'm in the one, two, third quadrant, I'm negative. So it's gonna be negative root two over two. So I can replace sine of five pi over four with negative root two over two. So what I'm really looking at here is the cosine inverse of sine pi, sine five pi over four, which is just negative root two over two, okay? And this is still some angle theta. So now I can use my definition of basically what it means to be an inverse function, right? I can switch the input and the output and write this as just regular old cosine. So I'm gonna go ahead and do that now in this step. I'll draw a little arrow here and I will switch these positions and write it as just cosine. So this is like saying cosine of what angle equals negative root two over two, okay? So I can find this angle, but what do I have to remember? It has to be within the range of inverse cosine, right? This has to be in the range because this is an output. It's an element of the range of cosine inverse, which is what? The range is range. Do you remember? It's from zero to pi, including zero and including pi, okay? So that means that whatever this angle theta is, it has to be within this range. So let's think about this. We have between zero and pi, and we have cosine theta equals negative root two over two. So we have a negative value, which means what? We can't be in the first quadrant. We have to be up here in the second quadrant, okay? And what do we have here? Well, a, a I always think of it, again, in terms of reference angles. A pi over four reference angle gives me root two over two for cosine, okay? But since I'm here in the second quadrant, I have a pi over four reference angle there in the second quadrant, which means my theta itself is three pi over four, right? So this full angle, which is theta, is three pi over four. So I found my solution, three pi over four. Three pi over four. Hopefully that makes sense the way I did it. I always think of it in terms of reference angles, and then whether it's positive or negative just depends on which quadrant it's in, right? It's that simple. So let's look at an example like this. We can already tell it's a little bit different because in this case, our outer function isn't an inverse function, it's just a regular sine function. And our inner function is an inverse function and it's actually inverse tangent, okay? So it's a little different because out here, we're no longer gonna get an angle. This is an angle, right, in radians. Out here, we're gonna get just a value, okay? And inside here, this is an angle. We're taking sine of some angle and getting a value, okay? So what we can do first is evaluate this inner function tangent inverse of negative one, replace whatever angle this is, right? Replace tangent inverse of negative one with whatever angle that is equal to, then take the sine of that angle and get that value. So that's what we're gonna do. So tangent inverse of negative one is like saying tangent of what angle gives us negative one, but what has to be true about that angle? It has to be within the range of inverse tangent. The range of inverse tangent is what? From negative pi over two to pi over two, but not including, so we use parentheses. Negative pi over two to pi over two, but not including, right? So let's think about this. I have negative pi over two to pi over two. I always draw a picture for these. Negative pi over two, pi over two, and my tangent is negative, which means what? It can't be here in the first quadrant. It's gotta be down here in the fourth between negative pi over two and zero. It's gotta be somewhere down here. 
Let's see, what gives me one for tangent? Let's think about this. One way to think about it is that tangent is sine over cosine. So if tangent is one, that means sine and cosine have to be the same, right? Where does that happen? Well, that happens at power over four, right? It happens at, where else? At basically a pi over four reference angle. So I have a reference angle of pi over four, and I'm in the fourth quadrant between negative pi over two and zero. So again, remember, don't wrap all the way around and come to seven pi over four. We have to be within this specific interval, right? So we're starting here, we're working backwards to negative pi over four. So my theta is negative pi over four, but what does that mean? That means tangent inverse of negative one is negative pi over four, okay? So I'm not done. I just replace tangent inverse of negative one with negative pi over four, and I take the sine of negative pi over four. So I'm going to make a little bit of room here. I got to erase a little bit. Sorry about that. And now I'm going to replace tangent inverse of negative one with negative pi over four and do the sine of negative pi over four. So reference angle of pi over four for sine, that gives me what? Uh, root 2 over 2, and since we're negative, we're in the fourth quadrant, so negative root 2 over 2. So that's actually my final solution here, is negative root 2 over 2, okay? All right, so these kind of examples tend to be a little bit more challenging just because there's a little bit extra work involved, and we'll see fully why in just a second when we work these out. But after this video, hopefully you'll be able to look at these and be a little bit more confident and know what steps to take, all right? So let's go ahead and get started. Tangent of sine inverse of five over 13. So what do we notice about this is that our outer function is just regular old tangent. It's just a regular trig function, which means in the end, I'm gonna get some value. When I evaluate this, it's gonna be some value within the range of tangent, right? So what about my inner function? It's sine inverse of five over 13. So this is gonna be some angle Right? And then I'm taking the tangent of that angle and getting that value. So what we usually do is we start from the inside, or at least I do. I start from the inside and work out. So that's exactly what I'm going to do. Just what we've been doing, which is rewrite sine inverse of 5 over 13 as just regular sine. Because sine inverse of 5 over 13 is like saying sine of what angle gives me 5 over 13. But remember, this angle has to be within the range of inverse sine, which is from negative pi over 2 to pi over two, okay, do not forget that. So this angle has to be within the range of inverse sine, and yeah, I'm looking for the sine of what angle equals five over 13. So maybe you see the problem and why this problem is more tricky. This is exactly why, is because this is something that is not on my unit circle, and I actually have no way of finding this angle without using a calculator. And we wanna do both these examples without using calculators. And we can, but we have to go all the way back to the definition of these trigonometric functions, right? And what these even mean in the first place. So what the sine function does is it takes in, right? The input is some angle theta. So we plug in some angle and what we get out is the ratio of two sides of a triangle. And if you remember this acronym, SOCA-TOA, right? So what sine equals is opposite over hypotenuse. So five over 13 equals y over r, right? That's the definition of sine is y over r. But this can also be thought of as opposite over hypotenuse, okay? So again, this is the tricky part of this problem is that I don't have to actually ever know what this angle theta is. All I have to find is the tangent of this angle, okay? And what is tangent of some angle? Well, tangent of some angle is opposite over adjacent. Another way to think of it is y over x. So if I can just maybe sketch this angle theta and find the opposite and adjacent sides, then I have my final answer and that's it. So let's go ahead and do that. So let's think about, first of all, this theta has to be within this range of negative pi over two to pi over two. So let's see if I can draw sort of a sketch of this angle. So negative pi over two to pi over two and my sine, let's see, my theta gives me five over 13, which is a positive value for sine. So my theta actually has to be in this first quadrant between zero and pi over two. Can't be in this fourth quadrant because that would make this value negative and it's positive. So first quadrant. So I'm just gonna suppose my theta is right about here. I'm just gonna sketch a theta, okay? So what do I know about this theta? Again, I know that, let's see, the opposite side is five and the hypo hypotenuse is 13. So if this is my theta, then this is the side opposite, that's five. The hypotenuse is 13. 
And now we see why we write this as y over r, or we can think of it as opposite over hypotenuse, right? It's because when we have this in standard position, our y is our opposite angle, our opposite side, sorry. And our r is our hypotenuse, okay? So what I need to do is I need to find, again, what is tangent? Opposite over adjacent. So I need to find this adjacent, which I'm going to call x because it is the x, right? We have x, y, and r. This is the x. So I need to find the x. And if I find the x, then I have the final solution. So I know my answer is going to be what? Let's see, opposite over adjacent. So it's going to be 5 over something. So I'll go ahead and write the 5 here. Oh, God, that was bad. I'm sorry. So I'll write 5 over something. I need to find what that something is. So how can I do this? Well, I have a right triangle here. And I know two of the sides of a right triangle. And I need to find the third side. So what can I use? Pythagorean theorem. So that's what I'm going to do. And I'm going to write out x squared plus 5 squared equals 13 squared, right? This last number is always the hypotenuse, okay? So now I can solve this for x. So basically, I'm going to work all this out. x squared plus 5 times 5 is 25 equals 13 times 13. That's 169. Now I can subtract 25 from both sides. Minus 25, minus 25. I'm left with x squared equals 144. And now I take the square root of both sides. And normally when you take the square root, you plus or minus. But since we're in the first quadrant, we know that our x is positive, right? So I don't have to really plus or minus as long as I know what quadrant I'm in. So x equals 12. And you may remember that a 5, 12, 13, that's a, that's a popular popular side lengths for a triangle, right? So it was three, four, five, and those sort of things. So you may have known that this was 12 just by looking at it, but you can always use Pythagorean theorem. So my x is 12, and my solution for tangent is five over 12. So I found this whole thing, I evaluated this whole thing without ever having to find out what theta is. Pretty cool, right? So let's go and do one last example, and then we'll wrap up the video. I may need to erase some of this to make some more room. Okay, sorry, I paused this video and I changed this to a negative because I wanted to show an example of a problem where our theta is not in the first quadrant, all right? Spoiler alert, we're not gonna be in the first quadrant. But yeah, I just wanted to mix it up with my examples I show, you know, so y'all can be fully prepared. If you see something like this on your exam, you'll know exactly what to do. These two examples will not be enough, I guarantee you. You're gonna need to work a lot more. I've worked hundreds of these and that's why I'm so good at them. But I remember when I was learning this stuff and being really confused and just doing it over and over and over and now, being good at it. It just takes practice. So hopefully this video at least helps you, you know, steer you in the right direction. That's the goal. So let's go and look at this. Cosine tangent inverse negative one half equals what? We need to evaluate this. And again, the process with these are pretty much the same. I'm, I'm going to end up drawing a triangle. I'm going to end up using Pythagorean theorem. I'm going to end up using my definitions for sine, cosine, tangent, all that stuff, right? So Katoa for sure. So definitely have that stuff down for sure. Okay. So let's go ahead and get started. Tangent inverse of negative one half, this is some angle, and I need to find the cosine of this angle, all right? So what I can do is rewrite tangent inverse. This is like saying tangent of what angle, right? Tangent of what angle equals negative one half, but this angle has to be what? Between negative pi over two and pi over two, but not including the boundaries. That's why I use parentheses here. Not including, this is the range of tangent inverse, okay? So my theta is somewhere between here. I have a negative value for tangent. So let me go ahead and sketch this. That means I'm going to be here in the fourth quadrant, right? Somewhere between negative pi over 2 and 0. Okay, I'm not in the first quadrant because tangent is positive in the first quadrant, and I have a negative value here. So I'm down here in the fourth quadrant. So I'm going to go ahead and sketch this theta. And again, we don't need to ever find out what this theta is. We just need to find the cosine of theta. And since, by the way, we can go ahead and note, since we're in the fourth quadrant, this is going to be positive, right? This is going to be positive. So just kind of think about that for a second. Fourth quadrant, our answer is going to be positive because cosine is positive in the fourth quadrant, okay? So again, what do I know about this? Well, tangent is opposite over adjacent, okay? Another way to think of it is y over x equals y over x equals opposite over adjacent, however you want to think of it. So if this is my theta, then my opposite is 1. In fact, it's negative 1, right? And my adjacent is 2. 
So what do I need to find? Let's see, cosine is what? Cosine is adjacent over hypotenuse. So I need to find my hypotenuse, right? So what is my adjacent? My adjacent is two. So I know my solution is gonna be positive. The numerator of my solution is gonna be two. I just need to find this value r, right? I need to find my hypotenuse. So how can I find that? Again, Pythagorean theorem. And in this case, it's actually easier because I have two squared plus negative one squared equals r squared. So two squared plus negative one squared equals r squared. Two squared is four, negative one squared is one. So I have five equals r squared, which means what? r equals root five. r is always positive. Right? So I have 2 over root 5, and you can even rationalize the denominator by multiplying top and bottom by root 5, and that will give me 2 root 5 over 5. Alright, so the process is pretty much the same with all of these. You always end up drawing a triangle, draw your angle in whatever quadrant it's in, draw the sides of the triangle that you know, use Pythagorean theorem to find the other side, and then write your solution using the definition of whatever trig function you're looking at. So hopefully this video helped. Hit like, hit subscribe if it did, stay tuned for more. I'm uploading a ton of videos on trigonometry, so make sure to stay tuned. And most importantly, don't forget to keep flexing those brain muscles. I'll see you in the next video.